Well, hello, Frank. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> These are crazy times, huh? Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's mad. <laughs> what do you think about what happened to the markets today? Well, I mean, it's just, I mean, uh, you know, a little bit knee-jerk reaction. I mean, they're just uh, uh, a little bit responding. They, they're hoping that uh, the Congress will approve the package eventually and uh, everything will be hunky-dory. That's what they think, you know. So, uh, but obviously, they're missing the point, of course. Uh, yesterday's uh, stock market fall was widely blamed on the failure of the package. Uh, you accept that explanation? Well, I mean, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, the, 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 there's always some reaction. I mean, people sort of responding, but it's got, you know, the, that's got nothing to do as such with the uh, with the package or anything, uh, anything like that. I mean, the uh, the market basically, uh, not always, but uh, over time, uh, reflects the facts of reality. And the facts of reality are that the real real economy in America is was badly damaged by reckless policies, uh, fiscal and monetary policies over many years. And uh, now it's sort of a, a payoff time, so to speak. You know, and uh, on a daily basis, we uh, obviously we cannot uh, p predict what may happen. But over time, you know, it, it's, we can say that the market uh, is going to reflect the real facts. And the real facts are not very good. You've been a great prophet of this all along, writing for years on the Mises site, uh, getting the timing down almost uh, exactly right. I mean, I quite often you send articles in, and then suddenly the next week the very topic will be uh, in the headlines. <laughs> you saw yeah. this one coming, huh? Yeah, look, you know, uh, I mean, it's not only myself. Uh, most uh, many practitioners uh, in, in this game, I mean, will follow uh, Mises, I would say, and or sort of a small commonsensical approach, uh, uh, you know, would have seen that, that uh, things, are, things are going to come because you cannot have an indefinite uh, uh, bull market which is fed by uh, such a crazy loose monetary policies, you know, that uh, and eventually the bus had to come, and, and that's what we see right now. Uh, when do you date the uh, exact loose, loose monetary policies and then the tightening that precipitated the, the disaster? <laughs> Well, uh, I basically think that the the the, the problem started uh, first of all with uh, uh, 2001 when uh, Mr. Greenspan started to uh, loosen the, its uh, monetary stance, or its interest rate stance. Uh, the lowered interest rate from 6% in in January 2001 uh, to 1% by June uh, 2003, and then they kept at this level until June 2004. And thereafter, they basically were moving by baby steps. They started to tighten by a quarter of a percent. So we had a, a, a and, and they raised basically the rates by by September. All they had uh, 2007, we had five and a quarter percent. Uh, the point is that uh, uh, when they have lowered interest rates to su such an extent, from six to one percent, it has given uh, a f foundation platform for for various activities, which I call them bubble activities, which uh, they shouldn't be there, and and that's really manifested in uh, real estate boom and and uh, and everywhere. In fact, we 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 got them, and uh, the the money supply doesn't matter how you measure. For instance, if you measure in terms of uh, the way I look at it, so-called uh, AMS, Austrian AMS, for instance, you know, it's uh, jumped uh, from a slight negative uh, we had uh, at, uh, at uh, in early uh, in, in early 2000, uh, 2001, uh, it, it basically reached at one stage uh, almost 9% by 2006, and it sort of was stood at this level for quite some time. So this is quite a massive increase. Now that we had, as Mises would say, uh, quite significant misallocation of resources, uh, squandering of uh, real resources from uh, uh, good activities towards bad activities, so to speak, that market would not promote. And right now we are in the midst of the effect uh, of the tighter stance, uh, which Fed uh, Greenspan introduced in June 2006. Again, I'm saying by baby steps. And uh, so... Uh, from one percent to five and a quarter percent, doesn't matter how how small the steps are, uh, you are you're, go you're going to strangle all those activities, that, false activities or falsities that have been created, and uh, and that's really what we have right now. We're experiencing the reversal of uh, of the of uh, so, the so-called the so, sorry the the artificial forms of life or false activities now under pressure. 
Now, what precipitated the tightening, do you suppose? Why did, why did Greenspan uh, decide that things had gone too far? Well, the, uh, the, the, the usual stuff with the uh, central bank, as always, that uh, they, uh, they're starting to feel that uh, there was going to be inflation, right? And uh, the way they measure inflation, the consumer price index or whatever. So initially, he lowered the interest rates because if uh, he, he was fearing deflation. Uh, him, and, him and later Bernanke joined the board. Bernanke encouraged uh, Greenspan to a large extent. Uh, to avoid deflation. So he said, well, we're going to buy insurance and we we'll lower interest rate to 1%. Once they started to realize that the consumer price index is not collapsing any longer uh, and uh, so not falling sharply, then they said, well, that's fine. I mean, we already achieved our task and uh, and there's no need to, to push more money. So therefore, we, we maybe ought to tighten a little bit. And that's really how they're usually doing things. And the economy started to uh, do a little bit better in terms of GDP, of course. And uh, it appeared to be everything okay. Therefore, I said, "Well, there's no need. Uh, there's no need to to loosen so much. We'll have to take back all the liquidity we have given to the economy. You know, we'll take it back." And uh, Greenspan made the assumption. They always make the assumption: uh, if you put the money, it won't have any effect. And if you take the money, it still won't have any effect. They're playing some kind some kind of neutrality. You know. Now they make a distinction between money and liquidity, as if it's uh, really they, they, there's any difference. Liquidity and money is the same thing, but they label it differently all the time. And they say we pump liquidity, uh, that's it. Now we take the liquidity out, no effect whatsoever on the economy for them. <laughs> um, well, it's the old monetarist story, right? Uh, neutral money, money in, money out. What does it matter? It doesn't affect the capital stock. It doesn't affect the shape of investments. That's right. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, even Friedman, who was a little bit smart and all that. Oh, basically saying, would say, all right, you know, in the short term, maybe we can have it, you know, but uh, it's not really important. I mean, uh, over time, it's all, it's basically money is, is, it won't have much effect, you know, and particularly rational expectation completely removed all this importance of money altogether, you know, and uh, they would say expectation will adjust everything. Right. Bingo, and so so money became really not important issue altogether. Yeah, the efficient market yeah. hypothesis, everything is going on is exactly right. Uh, yeah. All the time. Yeah, that's right, and everything everything adjusts quickly, and uh, and uh, and that's the problem with all these models because uh, you know, like if if you assume that money is non-neutral, and it operates uh, operates sort of a starts with the legs, which, which Friedman incidentally was accepting the time legs, but for him legs were quite mechanical, and he didn't really elaborate why they are time legs, as opposed to Mises. Mises really said it clearly that uh, money starts at a particular point. And it, the effect goes from one individual to another individual, from one market to another market, and uh, and that's really the the beauty about all that, you know, because that's really exactly how market really work. You know, you can see that money in a financial market, every dealer will tell you, uh, money goes from from one asset to another asset. Really, that's really that's clear non non neutrality of money. It's remarkable to think that the the whole thing is a surprise in some ways to central bankers and to people that follow these markets so carefully and closely and are in charge, but not entirely a surprise to people like you who uh, are well schooled in the theory. Well, I mean, uh, uh, I, we we all basically uh, have a <laughs> indebted to Mr. Mises for uh, giving us all the all the knowledge put it this way, and of course uh, my Mary Rosbud, you know, and uh, but. But uh, I believe that uh, some other people, like you know, uh, the in, you know, in the market players, who were not versed in Austrian economics, but intuitively they're actually responding to the uh, and uh, and uh, and getting to the same results. In fact, I mean, you know, I, I read you know, in various financial commentators, and some of them uh, reaching the right conclusions, although they cannot articulate as, let's say, the Austrians are doing it. Put it this way. Now, on, uh, we've got Congress rejecting uh, the bailout package, uh, which you don't suppose was going to do any good, right? You wrote that it was actually going to prolong the problems. Yeah. So we've got Congress rejecting that. They may or may not approve it. But uh, what's the central, the central bank doing now to uh, patch things up? And what are going to be the effects of that? Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, t today, the, for instance, Fed, uh, Fed got so many tools today. I'm actually surprised that uh, Fed uh, they actually uh, made the announcement of this package because you know they, they can bypass the package uh, easily 
Bernanke already uh, yesterday pushed uh, 700 billion into the market you know, in, in terms of money pumping, right? So, so, so they can even if the if the Congress, let's say, would not approve the, uh, the 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 package, you know, Bernanke almost got all the tools. He still waits for another tool to get the approval from the Congress to pay interest on deposits, uh, banks that bank help hold with the Fed, and he got he can pump uh, at liberty today. So, so for all the intent and purposes. The package is more just uh, they introduce it just for psychology's sake rather than anything else to, to say how we're doing something. We yeah. we try to save you, <laughs> but they, they actually there's no need for that. Benanke got all the means to do it. But uh, when you say pumping money, uh, the normal analysis to say that this is going to result in inflation, but you disagree with that. Well, the interesting thing is <coughs> uh, uh, that until today. Uh, and there are two things to this. Until today, Bernanke uh, 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 made the impression that he pumps, right? But he still was lacking one tool, uh, which prevented uh, him to create, to expand money supply, which is the, or, is, or the balance sheet of the Fed, so to speak, uh, which is the, uh, tar- the interest rate target. Because the way the interest rate target operates, it uh, prevents the Fed at the same time to maintain the target and, and expand money at, at liberty. Uh, so, Why does so, the Fed have to obey the target? Well, be, uh, well, it, it doesn't have to, but uh, but you know, but uh, but uh, b- because they're, they're saying, well, that's the, the, the our policy right now. Uh, so, in order to carry credibility, they will say, oh, "Okay, uh, we're setting the target, and uh, and the reason why we're setting the target because we believe where the interest rate level of interest rate should be, because uh, the underlying philosophy of the interest rate targeting is that uh, uh, they try to uh, hit the so-called the neutral interest rates, where everything is instead of equilibrium, and everybody and everything is hunky-dory and balanced." So the moment you sort of uh, don't uh, abide by the target you set, it means that you don't really know where you're going. So, it, so, so in terms of credibility, uh, they have to sort of uh, play the game. But uh, in action terms, there's no need for that. The Bank of Japan decided not to target anything and to sort of like lower the interest rate to zero, right? And, and, and after, after the event, they said, well, the target will be zero right now, right? But Bernanke doesn't want to have federal funds rate at zero at, at the moment. But uh, right now, last week at least, we had, uh, and, and I presume also yesterday, uh, federal funds rate already fell to zero, right? You know, so... So the day basically not not <laughs> when it needed they they may not uh, play the target. Okay. So what are they planning with this deposit uh, paying interest on deposit plan? <clears throat> well, with the interest rate on deposit, uh, it works as following. Uh, uh, what will happen is now, uh, if, if if for instance, uh, the, uh, let's say the interest rate target today is let's uh, today it's two two percent the federal funds rate target, and if uh, Bernanke decides uh, to push money. Uh, let's say 400 billion, just like that. Uh, by and uh, how it does it uh, by buying assets from the financial markets, like treasury bonds, it injects money to the system. Uh, the interest rate will will fall to below one percent, uh, to below two percent, could fall to zero. So obviously, he said, well, the, the federal open market operation automatically says, well, we have the, the sorry, the, the open market desk at New York said, well, we have the target, uh, and to maintain the target, that's what our our job is. So they will off, try to offset it by, by immediately t- taking money out of the system. Uh, in other words, by 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 basically selling selling assets to the market. And uh, and uh, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, there won't be much effect uh, on on the money supply. And that actually was the game, was the situation until until now. Uh, so Benanke said, look. Uh, because he's a monetarist and he likes to pump money effectively also. He said, look, I need to, to have the unlimited capacity to print money to expand my balance sheet, uh, the balance sheet of the Fed. And the only way I can do it if I'll be able, let's say, uh, two things. One is if the, central, if the, if the government will start, uh, st- start issuing debt, for instance, then, we, then it can help me. By issuing debt, uh, the, the government will uh, create pressure uh, on the interest rate market, on the, on, the, on the Fed funds market, because the government will absorb cash from the public. And, and once the interest rates will start going above the target, then I can actually pump money because I, will, I have to suppress, suppress the interest rates 
uh, going above the target, then it's good for me. And that's really how uh, Ben Namke was monetizing the, 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 how the debt get monetized, put it, put it this way. But now, if we have a situation where Treasury is not issuing debt, and, and I would like to have my flexibility regardless of what Treasury does, because Treasury already got very high debt, and it's not always possible to ask them to, to create more debt. So the easiest way is to print money. How do we do it? Uh, let's pay interest, interest to, to banks. Banks are holding uh, their reserves uh, and some of the money they need to, to settle checks with the central bank, with the Fed. At, at, at this time, right now, the, the Fed doesn't pay them any interest. So now if, if the Fed will start paying interest, let's say the, the, the interest the same as the target, let's say 2% at the moment, then uh, when the Fed will pump money, uh, there won't be any incentive for the banks, that, uh, the, in the various banks, to lend to each other in the, in the Fed funds market, uh, because the, 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 the moment you pump money, the Fed funds, Fed funds rate will fall to below to the target. But if you offer them uh, the rates of a target, why would you lend below the target? So first of all, nobody will lend because everybody knows that uh, we can get the money without doing anything, just to, just to sit on cash. Second, why, why lend even? Uh, you, you know, by lending, you're incurring uh, some risk. So, so that's really the solution now. Uh, you're paying them uh, interest on deposit, and, and, uh, and they'll sit on liquidity. And, and that's how Bernanke believes he will be able to pump money or expand its balance sheet, which is true. But the point is now, that's to your, to your second question, will it create inflation? Well, this is, this is dependent very much on, uh, on, uh, on uh, what money will do next. Because as, as Mises suggested, uh, money has to move from one market to another market, and et cetera, et cetera. And will this money move? Uh, and, and that's where the uh, bank lending is coming into the game. Because if banks will not lend, because banks may, may sit on the cash forever, ever. And that's what they did during the Great Depression, because uh, the risk is too high. Uh, they don't really know uh, whether the lending will end up in bad assets or good assets. And given the fact that uh, they have accumulated so many bad assets, they probably will not lend at all. And that's really the ob observation that uh, Mari Rosbat made in his uh, various writings, that, that during Great Depression, banks uh, ch have chosen not to lend because the risk of accumulating bad assets was far too high. So they were sitting on massive reserves. And that's what is developing right now. We also have, have a, good exa a, a good example now, a good, good uh, testimony to all this, what happened in Japan in, in 2001 and 2002. Bank of Japan has pumped to the, to the bank's deposits uh, pay, money at the pace of almost 300% at one stage. Mm -hmm. And the banks didn't lend there, and lending continued to collapse. So I presume that uh, similar things will happen here. So therefore, the, the overall, uh, if lending will not increase, then uh, we, can, uh, so we can actually conclude that this will not be inflationary, what Bernanke is going to do. But later on, it may explode, because uh, so one of these days, money, the economy will start uh, going, uh, going ahead, and then we, we may end up in a serious trouble. So once you end the, end the credit crunch, then the inflation begins? That's right. I mean, because the, the banks will see also so much liquidity. I mean, yeah. eventually, it, it will have to go. But initially, I mean, if, if they don't lay, won't lend, and uh, you know, and things and things things are very paralyzed, so, so nothing is going to happen in this sense. It in terms like of that, that's, that's something we need to. Well, it's a difficult uh, proposition because, on one hand, uh, downward pressure on prices would be a good thing right now, right? I mean, that's the saving grace for con consumers, and uh, the credit crunch will will force that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, the fall in prices and. And this is part of the adjustment. is a great thing because uh, prices uh, do not cause anything, as some people believe. It. You know, it just uh, uh, it brings things to some to some perspective. The fact of reality, the reality is that we're not as as rich as we thought we are. You know, it's, and and uh, we're much poorer than we, we believed we are. And that's really what prices are really uh, prices uh, are indicating also to us. So it's good to have this adjustment that at least we'll live in the reality rather than an illusion. But meanwhile, while this is happening, you've got banks accumulating massive reserves and uh, uh, preparing for the next round of lending, and then that's when the danger uh, hits. That's when the inflation takes off. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's exactly where they're exactly right. I mean, once, uh, once things will start improving and they're sitting on massive, uh, massive ability to, to, to amplify all that, that's where the pr trouble will start. Yeah.
Is this what, ha- what what happened to prices in, in in Japan? Which you're making a close analogy between the U.S. and Japan here. What what was the Japanese experience? Well, the, it's actually the, the Japanese experience took long time for the prices to move, but they started gradually to move. Also, I mean, the the interesting thing in Japan that that uh, uh, Japan has never recovered since the uh, early 90s. I mean, it's uh, it, because they allowed the zombies activities. That's what the the various politicians really want in America to stay alive, and uh, so so the so the nothing really it's all, all paralyzed there. In fact, I mean, the economy there is they never recovered. And, and the lending hardly moved either there. So that's why, I mean, that it moved a little bit here and there uh, for a short, brief period of time. So the price inflation go, gone up a little bit, but nothing really to write home about, put it this way. So because nothing really happened there. It's still in a paralyzed state. Yeah, because they did not let the liquidation take place. They didn't. You see, they, 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 they kept all the zombies uh, alive. I mean, so and for for the last twenty years, I mean, and that's really what you have, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, and that's really what what the guys in America are saying. Well, let's keep everybody happy. I mean, how can you do it? Yeah, yeah right. Eventually, these bad debts are going to have to be washed out one way or the other in order for economic recovery to take place. Exactly right. I mean, uh, that's the way I understand it, and that's uh, how I believe Mises understood that he was saying that. Uh, a recession, uh, what whatever we call a recession, is the first step uh, stages for recovery, and that it allows, enables the uh, good activities to take over and start to build up capital and start to move ahead. Because, uh, like you know, every, every businessman understands it. That's really what surprises me on a on a micro level. Everybody understands yeah. the logic of this, but all of a sudden, on the macro level, somehow they're getting uh, confused, which are really be beyond me. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, the um, so until this liquidation occurs, uh, we can expect a long, a long period of recession. Uh, but is there a way that we can uh, that federal policy can assist in making the liquidation more orderly? You know, some people are arguing this that look, everything is moving too quickly. We need a little bit of uh, some monetary injections, maybe the congressional bailout, whatever, as a way of 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 softening the blow. Well, I mean, uh, the, it's it's all it's uh, all those things sounds sounds sort of appealing psychologically, but I think it's all false. In the, for the reason being very simple, because when you say, well, let's delay it a little bit, it means uh, let's continue to support those those uh, zombies for a little bit longer. That's really what it means. And uh, the longer you keep them, the worse it's going to be for for the recovery. I mean, so one, I mean, when when uh, in in the UK, for instance. Uh, they don't, they basically don't don't bail them out. They say we nationalize them. That's the same thing what the enemy in the U.S. they want to do not to nationalize. But national, if you nationalize, you still you still basically uh, give resources to those activities which are not supposed to be there any longer. I mean, because real act, real activities are still channeled channeled to them, real resources. What you're saying is that it's it's nearly well, it is impossible to fight price trends. And yet, that's what the political class and the black class of central bankers is attempting to do. Yeah, you, you, they, they basically try to defy the reality that somebody is insolvent, and 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 there's no way it can become profitable. And they're basically gambling. They say maybe maybe this activity will become profitable if I'll wait for another thousand years. You know, in the year, and you know, after a thousand years, it'll be it'll be profitable. I mean, in the meantime, it kills all the other guys. I mean, we can't really deliver goods and make things uh, makes makes a hell of a difference for our, for our life. Yeah. Uh, what is the? Can you say a few words about the international impact of what's going on in the U.S. right now? Well, the international impact is that uh, that uh, most uh, most large banks uh, were all. Involved in this, uh, in, I mean, they all were involved in this whole monetary system. All the cent- every central bank uh, copies the Federal Reserve. I mean, so the, everybody is coordinating in, with everybody else. Uh, so, so you know, there are some certain time lags, but uh, on balance, they all pumped a hell of a lot of money. They started to tighten in the different degrees, and now they're all in the in the phase in the phase of uh, economic bust right now. You know that's what you see in Europe. That's what you see in the UK, and that's what you may start seeing in 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 countries like Australia. 
uh, and uh, and also in the Southeast Asian economies, it gradually will will hit there. And in particular, China, China uh, created a lot of uh, good things uh, because it moved away from communism. But then, for every plus, they also created a lot of minuses by by pushing a lot of money, creating a lot of false activities. Uh, so they have created a lot of wealth, but they're also squandering it now very rapidly. Started to squander it. But the, you 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 work at Man Financial and you're one of the uh, economists there, and I presume there are others, right? And probably they don't all agree with you, right? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, most m- most people don't agree with me. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I was thinking the other day, you know, that it's interesting. You watch the television news, and now suddenly the bears that have been with you know various uh, uh, firms of one sort or another are now emerging, saying, "Look, I told you so." But it occurred to me that that it must be very difficult in times in boom times to be a bear because everybody's saying, "Look, your forecasts are not correct. Look at the stock market is soaring, everything's going great, and all you do is sit over there in the corner and complain." Right? That's right. Yeah. Well, so so, so the solution to this is I found a solution that uh, during uh, uh, during the bull market, for instance. Uh, you, you you don't emphasize too much the structural issues that we are right now witnessing, and you sort of try to pay attention to liquidity, monetary liquidity, which misses uh, and Austrian economics gives you a lot of tool, plenty of uh, tools for that, uh, to uh, evaluate the market movement on a short-term basis. And I, I found yeah. that with Austrian economics, you can also uh, cater for uh, even for bull markets. And, uh, but uh, many Austrians making the mistake during bull market. They 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 only focusing on the structural issues, they, it, which is correct, but they're not don't they, but they don't happen or, or in the short term. That's the problem. Right. So you have actually called these short term uh, price price movements very very quickly. As I think back to it now, for five years, you have had both long term articles, long term forecasts, and short term forecasts. That's right. That's right. And and uh, so using using the money supply, for instance. Uh, the, using the as Austrian methods to evaluate what money is, uh, you can do quite well in terms of uh, assessing uh, a short-term movement also. But I've, I believe that, that ultimately what uh, helps good analysis is the, is the correct theory. And, uh, and I think uh, at the bottom line, you know, uh, theory is very important. And then you, with theory, you try to read the data. But when, when people only look at the data and try to extract theory from that, that's where the problem starts. Now, are you uh, resisting the temptation to run around and say, "I told you so"? I never do this. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's you know, uh, one has to be humble in this, you know, because it's uh, very dangerous. I mean, very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, even though I mean, the people who are correct about about the housing boom and everything, I mean, nobody really likes those people uh, even now, right? <laughs> No, they don't, because because you see, if 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 you if you bullish, let's say, uh, during bull market, and, and you're right, then you'll be uh, uh, they'll be praised and you'll be worshipped. Now, if you, if you, for instance, if you're wrong, they won't do anything to you because you were bullish, right, in the bull market, let's say. But if you bearish and you're right, you know, they'll say, oh, well, big deal. I mean, so they won't do, won't touch you, but uh, you know, it's not a big deal. But if you're wrong, they'll fire you, basically. You know? <laughs> Well, thank you for being so frank uh, with us over the years. You know, I mean, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a great help to our readership. Are you interested in having some more of these conversations? Because uh, I think these are a great benefit to people. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy to do it. <laughs>